grantees from our summer um, research grant, pre dissertation grant program. And we hope we'll be able to get um, an equal number of applicants and make an equal number of grants this year. Um, and the idea is to, as part of your award, you were asked, we asked people to make these brief and very informal presentations about their preliminary findings because after all this was pre-dissertation research and pre-dissertation research you get preliminary findings um, or pre-findings um, or anyway. But so um, they're going to speak for about 10, 15 minutes each. What did you say? Yeah? 10, 15. 10, 15. 15. 15. Okay. And, um, and then we'll have time for questions. And I think we'll have everyone present and then and then move to um, to the questions. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we're gonna um, I'm gonna say just a couple of words about each person. Our first speaker would be Eric Sippert. Um, he, he the title of his presentation is Grassroots Development and Transnational Flows: Building, Hacking, and Translating in Guatemala. Our second speaker will be Ana Uspina Pedraza. Um, you go by Ana Maria. Yeah. Am I the only person who ever called you Ana? Does everybody else call you Ana Maria? Yeah. Really? That was like most Anyway, Ana Maria is a PhD candidate in the, in the Department of Political Science. Uh, her research. Oh, I didn't say anything else about Eric. Eric is a PhD candidate in the Department of Political Science, also specializing in comparative politics and political theory. His interests include globalization, transnational studies, development of political economy, and resistance. His dissertation research examines how grassroots development organizations in Guatemala are a product of, respond to, and are part of transnational capital, cultural, and religious flows. Our second speaker then, I already said, is Ana Maria, who is a PhD candidate in political science. Her research interests lay in the, at the intersection of political theory, feminist theory, and comparative politics. In her dissertation, she studies the political language deployed by movement participants in popular assemblies, in, our, in Argentina, in Oakwell, and, and the U.S., considering how political culture and history influenced the deployment of transnational principles for protest. Um, our third speaker would be Vanessa Miranda Juarez. Vanessa Miranda Juarez is a Mexican cultural and linguistic anthropologist. She's currently the, in the anthropology department. In her PhD research, she aims at analyzing the role of that indigeneity plays the negotiation and use of an indigenous language as part of cultural contestation and resistance processes. She's planning to do one, a one-year term fieldwork in Mexico in Huasteca, in the Huasteca region, where she will conduct ethnographic interviews and participation, participant observation. Also, she will document naturally occurring conversations, speeches, and discourses. You must have been an Indiana student. Oh, so many people were Indiana students. Are you, you're still going to be working with them? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Good. Um, Rodrigo Dominguez Villegas, um, his title is Nahuatl Discourses and Political Speeches. I'm terrible. Uh, yeah, that's my fault. I, I think I pasted the wrong title. I'm sorry. Oh. What? <laughs> I think I pasted his title, her title, on his title. No. No, 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 no. I just oh. forgot to read your title. Oh. I'm just being a disaster of, a, of an MC here. You know, it's just, I'm being, what can I say? So her title, anyway, was Nahuatl Discourses and Political Speeches, Outcomes of Preliminary Fieldwork. Then, Rodrigo Miguel Villegas, title, Welcome Home, question mark, Government and Social Reception for Deportees and Return Migrants in Mexico. Rodrigo is a PhD student in sociology and an independent consultant for the Migration Policy Institute in Washington, D.C. His research areas include international migration in North and Central America, return migration, and Mexican migration policy. And then I should shut up and let you all start. Um, do you want me to, to police you? Yeah? Okay, so I will, I will hold my hands up and, and, and gesticulate wildly when you have five minutes left. And then I'll just give it more wild, wildly, wildly when you have to stop. Okay, Eric, please. All right, so thank you so much for being here, everyone. Before starting, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank Glackles not only for the summer funding, but this opportunity to share my findings and research. I'm sure that many of you feel as well that Clackles is like a refreshing space to be, to get away from our disciplines for a while. Uh, so this is great to be here with all of you. I'd also like to thank um, 
Anna and Jacob for setting up this event. So the title of my presentation is Grassroots Development in Transnational Flows, Building, Hacking, and Translating in Guatemala. It's based on the month that I spent in Guatemala last summer conducting preliminary pre-dissertation research with my funding. So in this presentation, I'll start by describing how I spent my month in Guatemala, um, briefly describe my findings, and then pivot to how I'm attempting to use this research as I write my prospectus and prepare for at least six months more of research in Guatemala starting in June. I'd like to emphasize that I'm currently working on this, uh, especially in the form of my prospectus, so I'm very open to suggestions, critiques, thoughts, and advice from all of you. <coughs> so I left for Guatemala at the beginning of last June with the goal of trying to understand how people navigate shifting labor markets. To be more specific, so what do people do when one large source of employment disappears and another fails to replace it? From previous trips to Guatemala in 2013 and 15, I knew that one example of this was former coffee plantation workers who had been born on these coffee, coffee fincas and then when the coffee industry crashed in Guatemala in 2000 and also due to a number of labor disputes, large amounts of people were kicked off these fincas and had to find uh, new places to live, new forms of employment, and so on. So my plan was to spend my first two weeks in a language school outside of Colombia, Guatemala in the coffee growing region of the Western Highlands and use this as a base from which to conduct interviews with former coffee workers. So before moving on, I should point out where Colombia is. So this is Guatemala, the southern half of it at least. The green areas are coffee growing regions. So here's the capital. Here is Colombia in the Western Highlands and here is Quetzaltenango, which will become important later. So the school I was at was located uh, right beside two new communities, Fatima and Nuevo San Jose, which both have between 60 and 100 people. And they were founded in the late 1990s to early 2000s by former coffee workers with assistance from the Catholic Church. So this is the heart of Fincas in Western Guatemala. Colombo is a coffee town, and these two communities are surrounded by Fincas, ranging from completely abandoned to partially in use to still being cultivated. So over these week, two weeks, I did approximately nine interviews with uh, former coffee workers. My interviews skewed a little bit older because I was interested in people that were actually born in the Fincas and really vividly remembered the transition as adults. Um, so there's a pretty wide variety ranging from men who were labor leaders during the struggle to women who had left these rural communities to work as domestic workers in the capital in Quetzaltenango and rural health workers. The second two weeks I spent in Quetzaltenango, but before getting there, I was told to include some pictures. So during my first two weeks, there was a 7.1 uh, magnitude earthquake, which made traveling around the Western <laughs> Highlands very difficult. So as you can see, this is a mudslide blocking the entire road. So the way around this is you take a pickup truck to one side of the mudslide, get off the pickup truck, like walk around the edge, and then get on another pickup truck and keep going. So this was very useful to kind of see how the infrastructure works in a place like the Western Highlands of Guatemala and how fragile it is in many ways. So for the second two weeks, I was in Quetzaltenango, which is known by its Mayan name, Shela, to most people in Guatemala, and I'll use that name from now on. It's the second city of Guatemala and has a metro population of over 600,000. There I volunteered with an organization called DESGUA, which stands for Desarrollo Sostenible para Guatemala. And I'll talk more about them later. Uh, but for now, the main point is their mission is creating alternatives to migration and reintegrating returned migrants, as well as promoting cultural identity, historical memory, and fair and local trade. And Shayla is their home base, where they have this cafe and social center that includes um, a store, a uh, cooking school, and a number of other things. And to give an example of some of the things they do, so while I was there, they had this festival for life and liberty that was in conjunction with a student group from the National University of Guatemala from the branch in Shela. Uh, everyone speaks Spanish here, so I don't have to translate. Uh, but if you can't see, it says, Por el derecho de defender los derechos. And this was for political prisoners from San Marcos, a uh, neighboring um, 
department in Guatemala. So they had a fundraiser and they had the families of these political prisoners, as well as the man in the middle who is a former political prisoner, talk about uh, mining and criminalization of protest in Guatemala. So this is just an example of the type of activities that Desgua is involved in, and I'll talk more about them later. So the findings from this one month in Guatemala were, I was really interested in tracking, so what do these people do after the collapse of the coffee industry and these huge shifts that require uh, fewer workers than before? So what I found was an increase in short-term contractual labor. So I think the majority of people in this region Every day, as a man at least, you wake up and you take a bus at 6 a.m. anywhere from an hour to two hours away to pick fruit or vegetables. There may be work there, there may not be. You're probably working three or four days a week and being paid very little um, on daily contracts. There's also a huge increase in urbanization in places like Quetzaltenango, as well as Guatemala City, which is experiencing this huge boom. And that's also directly related to migration. Uh, so many people talking about immigrating to urban centers, as well as lots of stories of people going to Mexico for short-term work, like two or three month contracts on ranches in Chiapas, or fincas there, and then returning. And then also the increase of what the historian J.T. Way calls a vendor society, where everyone's kind of transformed into like a micro entrepreneur. You're buying or producing uh, very small amounts of something and selling it for very cheap, uh, for very small amounts of money. So anything from selling like firewood to selling like little plastic trinkets to whoever you can. And what I found was these huge shifts both constrain and offer new possibilities. So an example of this that was really interesting that I found uh, talking to women was there's a shift where on the Finca women made much less than men but did the same amount of work. Things are not necessarily better now but one change is that with the huge amounts of migration to the U.S., Guatemala is now one of only a few countries in the global south where women are the majority of, um, I forget the title, but like the person in the family who controls the money, who is in charge of things like that. So shifts that both constrain and offer new possibilities. And I also really strengthened my connection with DESGUA, this organization that I've, that I've been working with for a few years during this trip. So upon my return, I started to analyze my data, write grant applications, and so on. I thought I had an interesting story with these coffee workers, and I thought it reflected broader trends globally, and of course the Guatemalan case has its own particularities, but I wasn't really sure what made my project unique and important. So at the same time, I was really honored to help Desgua plan a speaking tour across the U.S. and to host the president of Desgua here and have him speak at UMass. So after the presentation, my advisor Sonia said, wow, this is really interesting. You should think about studying this as well. And in very like typical grad student fashion, I fretted and stewed and was like worried, what should I do? So I finally just asked my interlocutors at Desgua and they said, we would prefer that you study us. Mm -hmm. Like instead of using us as an example for this case study of what happens with labor markets shift, um, it would be great if you could study us exclusively we think your research would come up with all of this data that would be very useful for us as well. So I kind of pivoted my research and I'll now pivot my presentation to my prospectus and some ideas for framing, theorizing, and naming this research. So first a little bit more about Desgua. So Desgua was founded in 2009 in New York City by two Guatemalan migrants and the one still active director returned to Guatemala shortly after. Its purpose, as I mentioned earlier, is reintegrating migrants, creating alternatives to migration, promoting cultural identity, historical memory, and fair and local trade. The home base is the social, social center I mentioned earlier, and it's called La Red Cat. So red meaning network, of course, in Spanish, and cat, which is the quiche word for network, and it's also one of the 20 days of the week in the Mayan calendar. So to enact grassroots development, Desgua enmeshes itself with local producers to sell things at the store, which they call Igualmar, which is a play on Walmart. <laughs> they, <So cool. laughs> they source food from local farmers, and they really try to create opportunities for returned migrants and to utilize the knowledge and the things they've learned in the U.S. 
So in many ways, this is the center of a larger network. The cafe also uh, hosts many groups visiting Guatemala. So in Guatemala, you have everything ranging from adventure hiking tours to church groups trying to do mission work. So Desqua will capture some of this revenue by hosting these groups for a meal that's cooked at the restaurant, and then they'll get like a 20 to 30 minute presentation that will focus on the Civil War in Guatemala, the realities of contemporary um, Guatemala and the root causes of migration. So from what I've been able to tell, these are the main source of revenue in addition to these fundraising tours throughout the United States. So what really is Desqua? This is something I've been struggling with. In a recent conversation uh, with a member, they said that Desqua is one-third NGO, one-third business, and one-third a network, with all of these identities overlapping as well as competing with one another. So this is kind of the puzzle I'm confronting, how to name this phenomenon. So the way I'm thinking of framing this at the moment is the grassroots hacking the transnational. So it's pretty well established that there are transnational flows, kind of the very base understanding is that they have effects on local populations. You have people like Millie Thayer who complicate this and say, no, local groups appropriate these things. They translate them, these change. I think I'm building on that even further and saying, these groups are actually going out of their way to try and capture some of these transnational flows, to redirect them. So what is worth theorizing about this? I think three things, structure, position, and practices. And I'll start by position. By that I mean a number of things. So Desquad's position both within transnational flows. It's creation of migrants who have returned to Guatemala. It's also pushing back against them. It's attempting to both stem huge amounts of migration from Guatemala, as well as to reintegrate people who are returning. It's also attempting to utilize transnational flows, these church groups that are coming to Guatemala, um, building on the transnational solidarity movement. So to move on to the second point, thinking about position in terms of time. So what is coming before Desma? What are they a product of? They're very much a product of the Maya movement. Um, the majority of people in Desqua are Quiche or Maya Mam. And this is very much about, um, I think a strong formulation would be asserting Mayan sovereignty or Mayan ways of being in contemporary Guatemala. Uh, utilizing Mayan ceremonies rather than, and pushing back against the spread of the evangelical church. Many members of Desqua are also former guerrillas. So these people are very much coming from the militant left. They're trying to imagine ways of political being in action in post-war Guatemala. And the Desqua from the beginning is very transnational, not only because of migrants that are, were in the US, but also because of US allies. And this is a direct descendant of the transnational solidarity movement from the Central American wars. They also position themselves within the discourse of development. So I think it's very interesting that an organization founded in 2009 explicitly refers to itself as a development organization. Um, that this is the discourse in which they feel they're able to most make their claims. So second, in terms of structure, one thing I'm thinking about is the borders or lack thereof. So there's no formal membership in this organization. Who is a member and who isn't? You come to the Desqua speaking tour talk, you're kind of a member, right? Or you could be in the very center of this. So I'm not really interested in defining the borders. I think that's actually against the mission of what they're doing. What I'm interested in is seeing what kind of productive work this open-endedness does. And as part of my project, I'm interested in trying to map this network. So the problem with the network like this is you have like formalized Desqua in the middle and everyone connecting to them, but if something happens in the middle, the entire network falls apart. So the way to strengthen a network is to have multiple centers. Uh, so that's way, one way I think my research can be useful. As part of this network, there's tons of translation involved, not only between English and Spanish, between Spanish and Quiche, and Maya Mum, there's translating of political projects, all of these different things. So here I'm really building on the work on translation uh, in translocalities, as well as Anna Singh's work, and then third, so the project. So what is Desba doing? I'm interested in practices, discourses, and narratives. So an example of a narrative would be, 
they always claim that they're building or constructing the Guatemalan dream. So what is the Guatemalan dream? I think is an interesting question. How do Guatemalan migrants who have been to the US and returned define that? Also, they use this language of hacking. And there's other scholars of the Maya movement in Guatemala who use this language of Maya hacking as well. So there's no presupposition of an outside. With hacking, you're always already within the system, but you're using it against itself to create something new. Uh, so I think that's going to be something really productive uh, to pursue, and this hacking allows the carving out of the local through the transnational. So trying to catch all of these transnational flows, but using that to create all of these intensely local things. Perfect. All right, skip the last slide. summer and then I'll just finish with some takeaways uh, about how that field work research helped me advance in my project. Um, so the title of my dissertation is Grammars of Identity, Political Languages of Activism in Argentina and the United States. Uh, my dissertation examines how intellectual tradi traditions and linguistic conventions shape and limit left activism. It evaluates the costs associated with the American left turn to policing speech acts as a site to pursue social justice. And it also examines uh, possible alternative courses to this trend in contemporary activism. I address this issue in a comparative study of two cases of broad social mobilization where popular assemblies reached an international significance and were also at the epicenter of the mobilization. One is the neighborhood assemblies of Buenos Aires throughout 2002, and the other is the New York General Assembly of Occupy Wall Street in 2011. The popular assemblies uh, are self-organized, non-hierarchical groups where people gather to discuss um, pressing political issues, organize political election, and address the daily needs of the community. So the images you see there um, are from the neighborhood assemblies in Buenos Aires, which then I, I took that to be <coughs> one of my cases and case studies. Um, the Argentine uprising of December 2001 represent the peak of the socioeconomic chaos resulting from structural adjustment reforms. Uh, after three years of economic depression, massive demonstrations, uh, Argentines uh, toppled two presidents within a month and left the, the state institutions basically cr crumbling. So in this context, uh, neighborhood assemblies emerge as a space for discussion, for reflection, for self-organization, and just at a, a basic, a very basic level for people just to get together and, and deal with their economic needs, with their basic needs for like, you know, services and so on. Basically they didn't, their coin was not operative, there were multiple coins at the same time. That was the level of the collapse of so people had to resort to like um, an informal economy to basically just like, continue with their lives. So by June 2002, the neighborhood assemblies reached a peak of 100 sites in Buenos Aires, and as a they uh, assembly participants 
became uh, a very important popular force uh, during that year. So this is where my, sort of like the context for the research I conducted in, in Argentina. Um, so in order to, uh, to gather data about the Argentines uprising generally, you know, from 2001, and then the, the neighborhood assemblies in 2002, uh, I conducted archival research in Buenos Aires for six weeks in the summer of 2017. This research was funded by the, the dissertation Fulbright grant and the Clackles Free Summer Presentation grant. So thank you to Clackles and to the grad school for allowing me to conduct this research. So um, I conducted archival research in two locations, the Biblioteca Nacional Mariano Moreno and the CELINCI, the Centro de Documentación e Investigación de la Cultura Izquierda. I don't have to translate that, right? Everybody speaks Spanish, that's great. And I conducted a research of secondary literature in the, through the Instituto de Investigaciones Gino Gervani, which is a, a research institute of the, of the Faculty of Social Science at the University of Buenos Aires. Uh, they were extremely helpful, and I am interested. <coughs> what did I say? I'm going super fast. Uh, so the research at the Emeroteca, the newspaper library, I um, basically conducted uh, research for, from press from December 2001 to December 2002. I focused my research, I mean, I had a very short period of time for research, six weeks sounds like a lot, but it really isn't that much. And so I had to be very strategic about what I was doing. And so I uh, focused my research uh, on the reports of events of protests, the Argentina Asso itself, the, the, the social uprisings, and on reports of the assemblies throughout 2002. And I chose these two newspapers, Página 12 and the Clarín, for methodological and for practical reasons. So Pagina Dosa and Clarín, they, they, are, they represent the two extremes. You know, they're the most popular in, in, in the two different extremes of the political spectrum. So Pagina Dosa is a well-read journal um, that's very progressive, and Clarín is quite the opposite. Um, so that's the, sort of the methodolo methodological reason. I wanted to, um, to get a sense about the, the language that was used from the press to speak about these events, um, but a language that was perhaps shared and to, to get a sense of like what, what forms of speech were shared and which ones were not, and which ones were ideologically driven and which ones were not. Um, and the practical reasons are that, um, so this is 2001, 2002, and to my surprise, when I started conducting research about this, uh, I realized that none of this is digitalized. And so it was, it was shocking because you would imagine that 2002, you can find it online, um, but neither Página 12 and Norplain have a very good um, uh, web repository of their news. And so, so I chose them too because I had to be strategic about what I wanted to look when I was there. Uh, and also because uh, La Nación, which is another important news outlet, they do have, uh, um, um, not an ideal repository, but it's is a much more accessible online space to look for news if you have a date and a title of the news. And so, so I chose those two as the ones that I couldn't access while being here, basically. With La Nación, maybe, maybe I can. There are ways to it. So, so those were my, my main criteria. Um, and so like the images that you see there, the one on top is from Página 12, and the one at the bottom is uh, from Clarín, and I don't know if you can read, but they are, so one, uh, they're, they're kind of two different interpretations of what it means for democracy and the role of democracy in Argentina at the time, and how neighborhood assemblies kind of have a role in that, in that configuration of meanings. So the, at the top, you know, it says like, para reconquistar la democracia, en toda la ciudad de Buenos Aires, en el conurbano y en las distintas provincias. Se, I can't even say it myself. Really talk very fast. 
el papel de las asambleas barriales. Eh, and so he goes on talking about. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it was bad. It was bad. It's not going to help you in the least to get it. It's Okay. Okay, so I just, these are, I, you can't read it, but like basically the, the, it's interesting how these two newspapers um, uh, envision uh, the assemblies as having a very different role in, in, in the transformation that democracy is having. So at the bottom, for instance, Clarín says, um, so that the, oh, sorry, that the, no, un, un final inevitable pero con perjuicios para la democracia, and then he says something like, um, you know, yeah, there's a lot of protests and that's great, but the, it means that the state couldn't even hold a state of siege, as though a state of siege was a good thing that the institution of the state needed to uphold. Um, there's more to the story, but um, I'll, I'll move on. And so, uh, uh, more of my research in Buenos Aires, so the other, the other part of the archival research was conducted at the CEDINCI. And, and um, so this is a very special space, and um, I was glad to focus a lot of my research there because um, it's an independent um, archive, basically. It is affiliated to the Universidad de San Martín, but it's actually a private institution. It is private from them. And, um, and so what I access were former personal collections, and I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. Basically, periodical publications um, created and, um, and spread and by the assemblies themselves, right? And so I was able to um, get, um, to access the publications of over 27 neighborhood assemblies uh, in a different different amount. For instance, this is an example of one, and how one of them looked like the Asamblea Vecinal Plaza Rodríguez Peña and their Boletín Quincenal. Um, some of them were very well read, and they had a lot of money to, pr to be produced, and so there was a lot of them. Others, other boletines were more scarce, and so I have a different sample from each. But I think I have a really good, I have a very large. Um, sample of, of um, bulletins from neighborhood assemblies and pamphlets and so on. And so um, the third part of the research that I conducted was focused on gathering secondary literature from the Instituto de Investigaciones uh, Gino Germani, I, IGT. And so, and so in order to do that, I ba basically went there, I talked to them, uh, and um, I made appointments with um, faculty associated to the institute. They work uh, on research clusters, and there was a, there used to be a research cluster on on protest, and um, they produce a number of things, and then they just uh, they kind of fe it kind of fell apart. But I was able to speak to some of the faculty that were part of the group, and they basically told me. Um, something uh, that I didn't understand until I went there and had those conversations, which, which has to do with Argentine bibliographic protection and ethnographic authority. So basically, all the scholars uh, that were writing in Argentina about what was happening there, um, they were all very active in all these movements. So when they write and you read their literature, um, they're not citing anyone. <laughs> They're basically just saying the things they're seeing. And so it, reading that from the perspective of the US, it's, it comes up a little weird. And it's hard to, like it's, hard to uh, it's hard to translate to the US, to the standards of the US production, because what you have to know then is that all of these people were participating in movements. So they didn't have to say anyone but themselves. And so, and so I have a commitment in this project to uh, engaged with the debates that Argentine scholars were having among themselves about, about what was happening. And so, so getting a sense of how they were producing, and um, it was very important to, to know this. And also because as they, were, as they were participating in this assemblies, in the protests, they were each gathering like little personal archives. And so they were collecting pamphlets, they were collecting all these boletines, they were collecting all sorts of things that they were gathering on the streets and they all ended with like, like a little personal archive that they were using to produce but that was nowhere else but in their homes basically. And so many of them, they donated those personal archives to Sedinci, the 
centro de, centro de investigación, centro de investigación de culturas de izquierda. So that's how they got them. Okay, so to close. Um, so what are the things that I ask and that I haven't, I don't have an answer to? But I think it's, uh, it is, I guess my, my trip there and my research there solidified the, the question about political subjectivity. I think ultimately one of the things I want to answer in my dissertation is whether it means something different to be an assembleista than to be an occupier. I mean, I think there are great differences, um, but it would be easy to kind of fold them both into the same thing as popular assembly participants. Um, and I think there are great differences that have to do with um, political history, with the tradition of intellectual production, uh, with the tradition of social organizing and mobilization. Um, just to talk about something quickly, like the human rights movement and feminism in Argentina, and like feminist organizing and um, black feminist thought in the US and how that has kind of trickled down, trickled down to activist spaces. So, so I think that really, that really resonates with what I found. Um, but I have to continue doing this research. At this point, just I have so many documents that I just basically need to go through them. Um, but that's, that's it. Thank you for listening. how many languages there are in the Mexican territory. Now what is part of the Yudrastican family? Typologically, this language is characterized by its agglutinary character and its rich morpholo morphology of prefixes and suffixes. The geographical distribution of this language is really broad. It is spoken in 16 states of Mexico and by approximately one and a half million people. Now what has at least four dialectal areas? This language was uh, the language spoken by the Aztec Empire when the Europeans first arrived to, America, to the American continent in the 16th century. Later in the colonial and independent periods, this language was spread in many regions. In consequence, now what is currently used in dispersed communities throughout the national territory and diversified linguistically through China. Since the confirmation of the national state, indigenous communities have received pressures to assimilate into the larger society, Mexican society including the use of the Spanish. The, prevalent of, the prevalence of the Spanish as the language of the nation and the government obeys to the logic of imposition of only one language as part of the ideological representation of race, race uh, which in Mexico and Latin America is known as mestizaje. Mestizaje is this hegemonic race ideology where the mystery between Europeans and indigenous is the principal mechanism of first uh, acculturation and assimilation. In 2003, the Mexican state, uh, state recognized indigenous languages as, as national languages through the general law of linguistic rights of indigenous peoples. This law ideally seeks to place indigenous languages as the, most le uh, the same level that, as the Spanish. However, the national ideology of one people, one fatherland, and one language continues to sustain this mestizaje project. The state, the state, this state recognition of indigenous languages is based on adoption of a larger neoliberal project, including neoliberal multiculturalism as, as a new way to govern diversity. Indigenous communities and local practices almost uh, always uh, link to the use of native languages, as well as in many cases, local governments are running indigenous languages. 
it is not possible to continue speaking a native language after more than five centuries of cultural and linguistic impositions that result in homogenization. It is not possible unless there is resistance to these forces. What interests me is to look at the daily life resistance which allow languages and their speakers to be still alive and continue to exist. For my, for my dissertation, I'm doing research on the use of uh, Nahuatl in the local government of San Isidro, Atlapesco Hidalgo, which is a bilingual community speaking Spanish Nahuatl located in the northeast of Mexico. Um, <coughs> what I want to understand is how the local form of governments called cargo system operates as a site, a site for indigenous language retention and value. I will pay attention to the community assemblies, similar to what you are doing, that are central to the cargo system as spaces for local political decision making that sustain indigenous language use. The cargo system is a civil, uh, civil religious and hierarchical institution found in rural and indigenous areas of the southern Mexico and Central America. The cargo system, um, system maintains social order through self-government, encompassing all community concerns such as political, um, administrative, civic, um, and social. In San Isidro, uh, the cargo system requires one year of unpaid service for men and women over 18 years old. Community assemblies elect municip municipal officials in the cargo system. The community assemblies actually exercise the highest authority within the community. Cargo systems, uh, uh, cargo positions are ranked and individuals ascend to more prestigious positions over the course of their life. The cargo system has been at the center of the social organization, organization of San Isidro since the community founding around 1910. Representatives in the cargo system uh, oversee with the federal and, uh, and state governments to obtain funding to meet the needs of the community. They also need the decision making in community assemblies. This negotiating character makes the cargo system a bridge between the San Isidro people, the federal and regional government. Therefore, it's essential for the community members to possess communicative competence in both languages. Nahuatl as the language used within the community and Spanish as the language used with the government and with the national society. In San Isidro, um, the cargo system relies more on the organizational and political affairs that and allows the indigenous communities to have the indigenous community to have particular political autonomy from the state. The cargo system is a social space where the community handles its political and social life, uh, mostly using Nahuatl. San Isidro, as many other towns in the Huasteca region, is compiled by uh, communities that base largely their economy on subsistence agriculture. Even though agriculture has a significant role in the um, constitution of Nahuatl societies, the subsistence economy, economy hasn't been enough to survive within the capitalist system. Consequently, uh, pe people are forced to look for other sources of income. Some of the complementary activities they have is uh, to participate in these governmental programs or migration to cities or large plantations of tomato, onion, cereals, fruit. Products that are all main, mainly sent to urban centers or exported to the United States of America. In these loose large plantations where is where people sell their labor force as their agricultural laborers. This temporary migration most of the time obeys their two harvest, harvesting season allowing people not entirely uh, to abandon their agricultural activities as well as to participate in the communal responsibilities within cargo system. In the summer of 2007, I spent one month in San Isidro. During this period, I had the opportunity to observe uh, men and women assemblies. I also interviewed interview about 30 people in the community, including the cook and cargo system representatives. Um, uh, I noticed that two main issues were discussed during my, my during search assemblies. First, um, the conflicting situation between the neighboring community called Quamontas and the possible solution to the proposal to build a bridge spanning the river that divides the two communities. And second, the concrete solutions to rebuild two classrooms of the primary school that collapsed because of rain and storm in 2016. Regarding the first issue, on March, San Isidro's neighbors clash violently with the community of San Isidro to push for the siding in favor of the construction of the bridge that could connect Quamontage with the new road leading to the city, the nearest city. 
Pamantas people, people blocks and Isidro entrance and exit of the community and cut the light for five days. With machetes and sticks, they wanted to force San Isidro local government, the cargo system, to accept the construction of the connecting bridge. This situation is just one of the many territorial issues between these two communities. Actually, the issues on land has marked historically the relationship of these two towns, like many other towns in indigenous towns in Mexico. On the other hand, the reconstruction of the collapsed classrooms was another problem that the community had to face at the moment of my stay. The collapse of the halls unfortunately killed one person. The federal, uh, the federal and the regional, regional government representatives who are in charge of solving issues on natural disasters visited the community to inform that the population had to take actions in order to reduce the risk of having other infrastructural damages. Representatives of the main uh, federal social health uh, program called Progresa also were present in the community to warn people and lead the campaign for preventing disasters. Both issues uh, were the main political and social concerns over the course of my participant observation and the data and the speeches that I collect revolve around them. An interesting consequence of this two conflict situation was the fact that the Isidro, San Isidro community, along with the cargo system, system assemblies, relied almost completely on the collective actions and the making decision procedures the cargo system lead uh, to maintain the community order. On both matters, they lacked the fully support of the federal and regional government, but they organized locally to determine how to handle their challenges. In both cases, the presence, the presence of the national and regional governments uh, was very little helpful. However, through their local um, government system, people in San Isidro ne uh, yeah, negotiate and acted, uh, acted accordingly. For instance, for the collapsed building, they required to pay municip municipal authorities a proper reconstruction of the primary school. To some extent, uh, they knew that there were little possibility, possibilities to get it, but they still negotiated. At the same time, they immediately started working on supervising the rest of the building on the primary school and rebuilding some of the walls, the, the old walls. It was actually by means of all the work they did together that the school was fixed. The municipal help never happened. In a similar vein, in the context of the clash, caused by their neighbor's community, the national electricity representatives arrived to the community until the fifth day they were without any power service. It was through Pacific negotiations and with communal strategies that they achieved to get their electricity service back and calm down the neighbor's violent initiatives. Certainly, is that the local political organization in San Isidro plays an essential role on all, not only in solving, solving internal conflicts, but also external ones. Like in the two main concerns they dealt with, with uh, over the summer and the last year. Moreover, the negotiations are almost are almost entirely conducted in the local language now, and sometimes it is in that language that they <coughs> take care of the external problems as well. So the use of now in San Isidro is intimately linked to the everyday life system that I am look at for my dissertation. The San Isidro cargo system is uh, the vehicle <coughs> for which the community refuses, refuses to accept national and regional policies that are considered disruptive, disruptive for the community. The use of the Nahuatl language is key to this resistance since Nahuatl is the channel through which decisions are made. In using Nahuatl as the language of the self-government, the San Isidro people exercise the right, the right of self-determination. Over my summer stay, I could talk and interview the representatives of the cargo system over the current year, but also with other individuals who have occupied cargo, cargos in the past. I was able to meet with the potential members of the cargo for this year. However, it was not really early to determine who is going to accept them. The cargo system, as I said before, is the way individuals give service to the community. However, during the last 15 years, uh, to accept a cargo has been a point of conflict, uh, mainly because the increasing need to migrate uh, to the job sites. Men have constantly uh, to travel out of the community uh, in order to sell the labor force, um, and their, their long periods of absence have provoked a change in the local political organization. My presence for only one month was not enough to observe the complete cycle that the cargo system follows. However, it, it was cru crucial for realizing the role that women have in such change. 
During my stay, I certainly noticed that the lack of, the lack of men since the summer is an intense period of migration. In that regard, women were taking care of the political issues that traditionally they did not. Rose women have normally been hidden and less publicly recognized. This situation opened one reserved question in terms of, of what is the role of women in, the, in this male dominant field of the political organization and the continuation of language use. Men being the ones who migrate to work outside of the community leave women in charge of household and communal relations. Even though women's participation in cargo system is not as visible as men, uh, they, have, they, they have the right of vote and, and voice uh, during the decision making process. Along with the increase in access of men, the possibility of women to participate within the cargo reinforces women's position <laughs> in the continuation of the indigenous language, not only inside of the household, but also in public spheres uh, such as the, the one carried by cargo system. Just the last thing, I would like to show you a small part of the video of the women assemblies that I recorded. about return migration to Mexico. Um, so there's something happening right now that not a lot of people know, and that's that, you know, whereas in the 1990s and the early 2000s, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people migrated from Mexico to the US, the migration flow between Mexico and the US is now reversed. Uh, between 2009 and 2015, many more people went back to Mexico and came to the US. And that's something that if you listen to the political, 
Uh, the wall will keep them in. <laughs> that's an exciting right? <laughs> So that's something that, um, given the political situation and discourse that you can hear in the States, um, not very many people know about. Um, but what happens to undocumented Mexican immigrants after they return to Mexico? So that's what my dissertation is all about. And um, so there's, you know, I'm going to give you a little bit of the context of the kind of like sociological research about this. Um, so there's like a few theories about what the what happens to international migrants in general uh, in terms of like socioeconomic outcomes. Um, so some people say that you know the outcomes, different outcomes of different people are explained by individual human capital accumulation, and that means like whatever you accumulate in terms of education or experience or other kinds of like you know getting ready for jobs or um, that yeah. Uh, other people um, explain how international migrants end up you know working in different places or doing different things um, by looking at their uh, psychology. So they study kind of like what are the psychological effects of, uh, of migrants. Um, and the same ideas have been studied for return migration. So there's a lot of people who have studied how uh, human capital accumulation affects the outcomes of return migrants. And also uh, there's a few papers out there that explain kind of like the outcomes of people based on their, the psychological effects of deportation. However, uh, at least in sociology, much more accepted is this idea of how the context where you migrate to actually affects where you're gonna end up. And um, these ideas are called, the, like the, it's like the theory of the concept of perception. And for most theorists, context of, there's like three parts of the context of perception. Um, the first part is the government perception, which are the policies that affect or control people migrating and affect whether people you know, get any services or any help when they migrate from one place to another. Uh, the second is social reception, which is any kind of stigma or prejudice that exists towards a specific group of migrants. And the third is support networks, so how do migrants relate to their peers and how, like, um, who do they go to to, uh, to get support. Um, and of course, all of this has been studied mostly by studying Mexicans and migrating to the States, right? And then also by studying North Africans and so on to Europe. But very, uh, very few studies have done, have used this kind of framework to study what happens in the first. So what happens when people uh, return back to their, the countries where they were born? Um, so I have some hypotheses, and I think that um, the context of return, in terms of um, return migration, uh, is shaped by how people return. So out of these return migration that I'm studying, there's two big groups, right? There's the people who are returning on their own, or not totally returning on their own, but at least they're not getting deported. So they decided to return at some point because of constraints or other things, but they decided to return, they're not, they don't get deported. And then there's the deportees, right? That under the Obama administration, the, the deportations just exploded. Um, so in a simplified framework, kind of like my dissertation studies how the form of return uh, affects the context of reception. So how do voluntary return migrants and deportees experience different contexts of return? And whether these different contexts of return affect their socioeconomic outcomes in the end. And the methods, um, I used to be a quantitative scholar until very recently, uh, but <laughs> so I have a lot of you know data, like a big data analysis. However, more more interesting, and um, which is why I use the the grand. No, I'm actually like really fascinated. Like I'm I'm really happy that I'm doing this. Uh, our um, in depth interview. Uh, because I really want to study what the mechanisms are behind the trends that I'm, I am finding that there's different outcomes uh, between these two groups in the quantitative analysis, and I really want to understand why, right? So, and I really want to understand exactly wh how, what it is that's happening when people return. Um, so, you know, the goal when I started this project was to have 16 depth interviews, 30 with Portuguese, and 30 with voluntary returns. 
So how did I use the Clackles Fellowship last summer? Uh, so I went to Mexico and I did a lot of things. Um, I started with attending public forums on the on the issue. And from there I started uh, networking. So I met a lot of people and then um, I got connected to NGOs and to other academics that are studying this, this phenomenon. Um, through the NGOs, I was able to interview 11 people. So I did 11 pilot interviews. Um, and I had like, this actually really helped me um, restructure my interviews because my interview guide, when I went there the first time, was just very horribly designed, I noticed. Um, and so I could refocus. But most importantly, um, I realized that there's a lot happening in Mexico City about this phenomenon. So it made me focus my research, uh, at least the qualitative part, on what happens to people when they return to Mexico City and not to other places in the country. Um, so during the semester, I started analyzing my um, pilot interviews. And also, I kept really strong connections with the NGOs and with other academics that were studying these. Um, so I could go back in, during winter break. And during break, winter break, thanks to a grant from the graduate school, I was very able to interview 76 people in person. Um, and I also did nine interviews with government officials, and I am doing actually 13 online interviews with return migrants that are not from Mexico City. Um, I still want to know what happens to them, even though my project is really going to be, the quality part is going to really be focused on Mexico City. I think it would be a good idea. Like, it's a nice kind of contrast mm -hmm. to know what happens outside of the city. Um, so let me show you a few of the findings, or a few of the things that I think are interesting. Uh, some of it, well, I have to say that I'm glad that I'm presenting this, because this is theoretical. Like in some ways, a little bit of therapy for me because uh, <laughs> I was it was a really intense trip, and the stories that people have told me are like many of them are very shocking. So like it's still hard for me to talk about them sometimes. Uh, so the first thing, um, something that's very not very well known is that every week there's three airplanes from the states that arrive to Mexico City. So most people think that people who are migrating from the U, uh, who get deported from the states to Mexico City, get deported at the border, and yeah, that's that's actually true. The majority.